further ado, I would like to present Dr. Lisa Barrett. We are thrilled to have her here. She is a distinguished professor of psychology at Northeastern University, focusing on the study of emotion. So, Lisa. Thank you. Thanks very much. Well, thanks everyone for coming out this evening. I really appreciate it. Uh, I am Lisa Barrett, and uh, in the back there is Joseph Fridman, who is the Director of Science Communication uh, for my laboratory. Uh, and that's my husband, Dan Barrett. I'm the arm candy. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'm going to talk to you today about um, the science of emotion. This is... Uh, this talk is really, think of it like a kind of a tasting menu of topics in my book, How Emotions Are Made, The Secret Life of the Brain. I can't compete with an undercover FBI agent or uh, a chef who will provide you with lunch. Um, but what I can do is talk to you a little bit about the signs of emotion, some of which is pretty counterintuitive, frankly, uh, at, which is why I decided to write this book. The book was published two years ago. It's still selling like gangbusters, it's doing really well. Um, Invisibilia did a whole season, uh, motive, their whole third season was actually motivated by the book. Um, and so I'm just gonna give you, I'm gonna touch on some highlights tonight. Um, we're a pretty small audience, uh, so I would suggest that if you have questions, feel free to interrupt. We'll treat it more like a you know, workshop, and, uh, but I will reserve the right to answer the questions at the end if I think it's going to take too long for me to answer. As you'll discover, brevity is not my strong suit. So, um, so who here likes cartoons or liked cartoons when they were younger? I still love cartoons. Um, cartoon chemistry is about mixing colorful liquids in test tubes until they explode. Cartoon physics is about uh, running off a cliff and not falling until you look down. <laughs> physics and chemistry are not the only sciences that have cartoons dedicated to them. Thanks to Pixar, we have little characters in our brain, uh, little characters that live in our brain, one for joy, one for sadness, one for disgust, one for fear, one for anger. Joy is the leader, of course, because this movie was filmed in the U.S. where we have 500 best-selling books on how to be happy. You guys are a tough crowd. Uh, okay, I, sh I should maybe have you stand up and like, cl you know, clap or when people are supposed to laugh or something. Uh, no one actually expects cartoons about chemistry and cartoons about physics to actually instruct you about how chemistry and physics really work. But when Pixar made this film, they came out uh, with the claim that the film actually represents pretty much the science of how emotions work in your body and brain. And a number of scientists gave interviews in very public places to that effect. But you know, Pixar has made many films where they've endowed emotions in cars, in toys, in little robots, and now in people. So according to Pixar, these little characters live in your head and they are at a control panel um, and they are controlling your emotional life. Um, and the, basically the movie was filmed in such a way as to represent what was until recently, I would say, the dominant scientific view in emotion. But uh, this approach, even though it's very popular and it's very, very much a part of our common sense in this culture, is, is as fictional as Wile E. Coyote, as I'm about to show you. So it, 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 I'm going to show you three fictions about emotion that have to do with, brace, with, with faces, with bodies, uh, and with brains. And what I'm going to do is um, tell you the first uh, fiction, and then I'm going to show you why it's wrong. So the first fiction is that emotions are displayed on the face with expressions that we recognize. The claim is that everyone around the world is supposed to smile when they're happy, they're supposed to frown when they're sad, they're supposed to scowl when they're angry, 
these expressions are not only supposed to be made universally, they're supposed to be recognized universally. This um, idea that there are a common set of emotional expressions that you can read on anyone, you can read people's emotion on their face, is actually the basis of billions of dollars being spent in the um, tech industry to read emotion in faces. Uh, the United States spent $900 million, $900 million, training TSA agents to detect uh, nefarious uh, plots in um, potential terrorists based on the assumption that you can read someone's intention off their face. So, how does this person feel? Bad. Sorry? Oh, bad. They look bad. bad. Mm -hmm. she, be sneezing. she could be sneezing. Thoughtful. Thoughtful. Laughing. Laughing. Contemplating. Contemplating. Most often when people see this face, they say, oh, she's sad, she's grieving, she's feeling horrible. This is actually my daughter, Sophia, at the Cologne uh, Chocolate Museum on her second chocolate drink, I might add. And, I, you know, she's in a state that I could only describe to you as profound pleasure. Yeah. This little sweetheart is also experiencing profound pleasure. And the lesson here is that People move their faces in very different ways, even when they are experiencing episodes of the same emotion category. So both of these people are pleasant, but if we actually look at the structure of their expressions, they're very, very different. You don't scowl all the time when you're angry. When is the last time that you saw someone win an Academy Award for scowling? Like never, right? And it turns out on average, people scowl about 20 to 30 percent of the time when they're angry, which means that 70 percent of the time when they're angry, they're not scowling, they're doing something else with their faces. And uh, scowling is not specific to anger. People scowl all the time. For example, my husband makes a full-on facial scowl when he's concentrating really hard. And apparently I do too, which scares the crap out of my graduate students, right? Um, People scowl when they're curious, they scowl when they are confused, they scowl when they have gas. People scowl for all kinds of reasons. Now, if we just look at this little guy's eye region, he's making an eye, he's moving his eyebrows in a way that is the stereotype or um, idea of, of what anger is supposed to look like in our culture. So for example, This guy is often seen as looking, you know, enraged. Does anyone know who this is, actually? He's a singer. He is not a singer. He probably wishes he was a singer, but he isn't a singer. This is actually Jim Webb, who in 2006 won the senatorial race in Virginia, which returned the control of the Senate to the Democrats. When I'm in Massachusetts, I like us all to just take a moment and simulate that. I can tell you I've given talks all across the country, in fact, in many countries in the world, and in, if you're in Europe, that's a, that, this is a great joke. Um, if you're in the middle of the country, nobody laughs <laughs> at all. But the cool thing about this is that when you just look at Jim Webb's face, um, he looks enraged. When you look at the context, though, it makes it really clear. He's energized and he's super enthusiastic. But he is making a facial expression that we think of as the prototype uh, for anger. And so the lesson here is that people not only move their faces in very different ways when they're experiencing instances of the same emotion, they actually move their faces in exactly the same way when they're experiencing very different emotions. The point here is not that um, the way that you move your face is random when you're having an emotional experience. It's that when it comes to emotion, a face doesn't speak for itself. You cannot just look at someone's face and know how they feel. No matter how confident you are, your brain is just guessing at how someone feels. And even though you're attending to their face, you're actually, your brain is taking in the whole scene, right? So what is the person, 
what is their body posture? What does their vocalization sound like? And even what is your body doing? What's happening in the internal core of your body that influences the kinds of brains that your guess, your, the kinds of guesses that your brain makes uh, when, um, when, when you see emotion in another person. So when you see emotion in another person, your brain is actually making a guess. It's automatically, effortlessly guessing at what facial movements mean. And these guesses uh, are, you know, they happen um, pr like in the blink of an eye without awareness on your part. And even if you're super confident that you know how someone, you think you know how someone's feeling, you're actually just guessing. And these guesses are how we make meaning out of the raise of an eyebrow or the curl of a lip or the tilt of a head. It's also how a single movement like a smile can mean very, very different things depending on the situation. So when it comes to emotions, variation is the norm. The idea that people scowl when they're angry everywhere in the world and that we can just look at a scowl and read anger in a person's face is a stereotype. Um, it's a stereotype that's very popular, but it is a stereotype. And for those of you who aren't familiar with um, the movie Inside Out, which is a great, um, it's a really fun movie, but it's a great example of the use of stereotypes in film. Mr. Anger here uh, actually turns out to make many, many expressions in the movie. And of course, if he didn't, he'd be a totally boring character if he was just blowing his stack every single time and that's all he ever did. In fact, he uh, goes through a range of, of emotions himself, as do all the characters, frankly, which is why it's such a cool movie. So in a sense, if you just look closely at this film, it actually contradicts its own message, <laughs> uh, which I think is pretty funny. Um, the next fiction about emotion is going to have the same kind of theme to it. The idea that people have believed for a really long time is that each emotion has its own unique physical pattern of changes in the body. So heart rate is supposed to go up in fear, and your blood pressure is supposed to go up in anger, and so on and so forth. And rather than show you hundreds of studies, I'm just going to give you the punchline like I did last time with some images. And that is the following. When you're happy, you might be doing very different things with your body. You might be having a walk in the woods. You might be lying on the beach uh, with your family and friends. You might be baking a cake um, from scratch. Uh, for, uh, for, for a party. You might be doing yoga. You might be gossiping with a friend. Well, you might be having coffee with a friend. If it were me, I'd be gossiping. Uh, you might be um, planting something in the garden. Each of these actions, these physical actions, require different, um, require different internal uh, demands on, on, make different internal demands on your body. So in some cases, when you're happy, your heart rate will go up. In some cases, when you're happy, your heart rate will go down. In some cases, it will stay the same. Same thing for um, anger, for sadness, for fear. Actually, when we look at the evidence across hundreds of studies, there's no individual pattern for any emotion. So it's not like I can just um, measure your heart rate and know how you're feeling. It's not like I can just measure the amount of um, sweat on your skin and know how you're feeling despite uh, other claims uh, to, you know, despite claims in the media and, and so on. Um, in fact, we've known since the 1970s that when we measure what your heart is doing, what your lungs are doing, what the internal uh, organs of your body are doing, they are moving in sync with whatever the physical movement is uh, that you're about to take. Um, so if you move in very different ways when you're in an emotion, sometimes in anger you approach, sometimes in anger you withdraw, sometimes in anger you sit silently and plot the demise of your enemy, sometimes in anger you laugh, sometimes you cry. In each instance, um, what you are physically doing is going to be a better predictor of what's going on inside your body. So the idea, for example, that um, we can detect somebody's intention um, or or they're lying, right, by just measuring something about the electrical um, activity across their skin, like in a lie detector, is false. And it's been known that lie detectors don't work really for... I I lie. I'm sorry, I lie, yeah. <laughs> Prove it. <laughs> you can't. Well, it shows you're activated. That's 
Exactly. All it shows is that you have sympathetic nervous system activation. So you're, you're basically, your brain is ramping you up, but it doesn't actually explain why. Years ago, there was a theory talking about uh, appraisal of uh, Schechter and Singer, I think, about <laughs> you can raise somebody's um, act activation level with adrenaline and put them into different situations and the type of situation that they're in would necessarily uh, impact the kind of expression they would have. Right. That's right. So the idea from, this is a, a famous uh, set of experiments from the 1950s and 1960s, what they would do, we're not allowed to do these things anymore to people, but what, what scientists would do is they would shoot them with full of adrenaline, they would give them a shot of adrenaline, and then they'd put them in a situation, so some people got a shot of adrenaline, some people got a placebo. And then they would put people in a situation where they were around somebody else who got really pissed off, or who got really excited. And what they found in the experiments is that participants in the experiment would interpret the increase in arousal very much in line with whoever was around them. So if you, we shot you full of adrenaline and you were next to somebody in a waiting room who got super pissed off, you would get super pissed off. You would make sense, your brain would make sense of that increase in arousal as, as anger. Um, so you're looking for context cues. Exactly. And this is actually a really important, um, I'm going to, you know, what we've done, I would say, uh, is show the, n the neural b underpinning of how this happens, of, of how people uh, make sense of their internal bodily sensations in terms of what the context. But the important thing here is that there are many, many things that can ramp you up and increase your arousal levels. For example, novelty, uncertainty, um, when anything is uncertain or um, unexpected or uh, when you don't get enough sleep, when you have had too much coffee, when you're underhydrated, um, I can go through pretty much every aspect of modern life. <laughs> this is a really important thing because um, part of what's happening in our culture right now is people are walking around with increased levels of arousal and there are a multitude of uh, narratives and context. For example, Fox News does a great job of replicate, even though they don't know Schachter and Singer, they are using Schachter and Singer to whip everybody up into a sense of fury um, by raising their arousal levels and giving them a narrative to explain that arousal. Um, it's, it's actually a brilliant, uh, a brilliant strategy. Um, the thing is that uh, it, what's really important, I think, to understand here is that uh, we don't just see um, different physiological patterns in, in the same emotion. Uh, we also see instances of the same emotion. We also see the same pattern that can be observed in different emotions and actually in non-emotional states just like we talked about, but here's one that I want to draw your attention to. Um, when uh, people are experiencing anxiety, an increase in arousal, and um, they sweat, and they have tightness of, of breath, and they sometimes have muscle tightness in their um, upper chest and in their gut, uh, that actually is the same, exact same symptoms as people who are um, uh, in the first stages of a, a heart attack. And actually, women over the age of 65 die more frequently from heart attacks than men do because they go to the emergency room and they're experiencing these symptoms, which they experience as anxiety. Their brain is making sense of the symptoms of anxiety. Their doctors check them out. The, the, doctor, the emergency room doc checks them out. They don't, aren't showing yet any signs of, a car, of cardiac arrest. And so the physician tells the woman, you're just having an anxiety attack, and she goes home and promptly dies. This actually happened to the publicist my, in the UK who is a publicist of my book. Her mother died this way. And I thought this happened mainly to women. That's what the literature shows, the research shows. But then a friend of mine named Jim Cohn, who is also a neuroscientist and who is at the University of Virginia, he's uh, probably, I don't know how old he is, maybe he's at least five years younger than me. So he's in his 40s. Um, and he runs a podcast called Circle of Willis. 
And when my book first came out, he interviewed me and I told him this story about the research on why, you know, why is it important to understand how your brain is making emotion because there are many uh, other reasons for your body to get worked up other than the f idea that you're in an emotional, um, an, in a worked up emotional state. And, uh, and then uh, right, I would say in September, uh, I got an email from him this September telling me that he had just come home from the hospital. And in the October, actually the Halloween version of, um, I would encourage you to listen to the Halloween podcast on Circle of Willis because he tells the story much better than I do. But basically, he was having what he thought was anxiety symptoms. He was having a lot of anxiety and uh, he went to the doctor, doctor checked him out, said, you're fine, it's just anxiety. And he, but it was getting worse and worse and worse. And he was going to lay down to try to take a nap and try to get calm. And he says, <laughs> he heard my voice in his head saying that, you know, people are often mistaking uh, anxiety symptoms, uh, mi mistaking the first signs of a heart attack for anxiety. So he, um, you know, what kept him from going to the hospital was the sense of embarrassment that he might feel. Uh, when he, you know, was told, oh, you're really fine, it's just, you know, you're having anxiety. As someone who studies emotion, he felt like this was a very embarrassing thing to have happen. But he went nonetheless, he went to the hospital, he, they checked him out and they said, you're fine. And, but his pain was getting worse and worse, his anxiety was getting more <laughs> intense, his physical sensations were getting more intense, he was getting more and more uncomfortable. And this is the moment at which physicians would have sent, the, a, a, if he had been a woman, he would have sent her home. But instead they said, wait, we'll get a cardiologist to come and see you. The cardiologist walks into the emergency room and he has a massive coronary right in the room which they call a widow maker. If he had been anywhere else, he would have been dead. And it was such a serious heart attack that they had to basically treat him without anesthesia. There was just no time he would have died. So my point to you um, is that physical changes in your body have no inherent emotional meaning. Your brain is making sense of your body and sometimes it's making sense of physical changes in your body as an emotion. Emotions are not little circuits in your brain that trigger and then cause you to have physical changes in your body and to act in um, ways that, uh, over which you have no control. That's the myth, you know, for that's the popular belief. I should also point out that's the belief that um, is embodied in um, the US legal system and uh, many other legal systems. But it's a fiction because it's not true. The third myth uh, for this evening that we'll talk about briefly is the idea that each emotion has its own dedicated character in your brain, like an inside out. The idea is that each emotion has its own dedicated circuit in your brain. This is something that has been um, a popular belief really since the mid, um, the mid 20th century, I would say. The idea is that Fear is supposed to live in a, a part of your brain called the amygdala. How many here have you heard, have heard of the brain region called the amygdala? Yeah, it's like the rock star of the brain. Everybody's heard of it. People write stories about it. Um, it has no shame. Uh, actually, it does have shame. Uh, but the idea is that every brain region um, that's related, that every emotion has its own brain region where the circuit um, for that emotion uh, lives. So we, I am going to show you now one piece of data and I am going to show you brain image because I am a neuroscientist and if I don't show you brain image, I get kicked out of the club. So here's the brain image. This is actually a picture of a brain where if, if I sawed my brain in half, as many of my colleagues would I'm sure like me to do, and just pop the, my face off if I were looking in the mirror, that's what we would see. I mean, it would be more bloody, but that's what we would see. And you guys, man, that, that was actually not that bad a joke, seriously. Like, it was a, I'm, you know, okay. Anyways, oh, what I've done is I've circled one amygdala for you. Here's the other one on the other side. So this is the top of the brain. This is the bottom. And, uh, you know, eyes and nose and so on would be looking out this way if it were there. 
And so what we did is we, we found all of the brain imaging studies uh, that where people had their brain scanned while they were experiencing an emotion. And we just asked, well, in what proportion of studies where people were experiencing fear did we see uh, an increase in amygdala activity? That's what you would expect to see if the amygdala is the home of fear. Um, and we saw that in about 30% of the studies, just a little less than 30%, uh, we do see an increase in amygdala activity when people are fearful. So that's more than what you would expect by chance. But it's nowhere near what you would expect to see if the amygdala was the home of fear in the brain, the way that many scientists had claimed and many um, science journalists continue to claim. Um, uh, in fact, you'd expect to see something more like 90 or 95 percent of the studies, because you know you, there might be some studies that have error, for example. But even more importantly, every emotion uh, that has been studied with brain scanning has some proportion of studies uh, where there is an increase in amygdala activity. So your amygdala is not for fear. It's not for negative emotion. It's actually not even for emotion. So if I took anyone in this room and I put you in a brain scanner and I showed you a bunch of images that you'd never seen before, just things that are novel, scenes that are novel, faces that you've never seen before that are completely neutral, or um, you know, um, uh, maybe objects that you haven't seen before, you know, like a car you'd never seen before, or a house you'd never seen before, or a hammer you'd never seen before, uh, we would see an increase in amygdala activity uh, in your brain. Because the amygdala is basically like a signal to the rest of your brain that says, hey, this is novel or uncertain or ambiguous. You be we better learn about it uh, so that we can um, b better make sense of what this is next time. So uh, the idea that um, the amygdala is not specific to, to fear is something that generalizes uh, for all emotions and all brain regions that have ever been claimed to be the home of an emotion. So for example, people claim that the anterior insula, in your, which is a part of your frontal cortex, is the home of disgust. Well, the insula, it turns out, is a, a hub in your brain that's very densely connected. Uh, and it, not only is it important for emotion, it's important for every mental event you ever have in your life. If you have damage to your amygdala, I mean, sorry, to your insula, uh, there's a very good chance uh, that you will die. So it's just, it's a part of the brain that's very, very important for regulating the body and for um, representing the state of the body, basically. So the punchline here is pretty much the same um, as before. Um, you know, we see the same kinds of brain changes in uh, different emotional states, and we see different emotional change, uh, different uh, neural changes, even in different instances of the same emotion. And so this leads us to the conclusion, along with a lot of other evidence, that emotions are are complex constructions in your brain. They're really not simple circuits. So Inside Out does this really cool thing in the movie. They, it's very, very clever, where what they do is they, um, they show the same characters in every person's head, you know, even in um, animal um, brains, to make the point that um, you know, there are a set of universal circuits in the brain, and we all have them, and other, we share them with other animals, because other animals have emotions just like ours. In fact, there was a very popular book that was just published a couple of weeks ago by Franz de Waal making this claim. And every year or so, somebody comes out with a book claiming that animals, non-human animals, have exactly the same emotions uh, that humans do. Uh, but the fact is that, um, your brain does not come pre-wired with emotion circuits that are shared with every other animal on the planet. Um, that is not how emotions work. There is no part of your brain that is dedicated to emotion. Just like there is no part of your brain that's dedicated to rationality, and your brain is not a battleground between emotion and thinking or rationality, that's a myth. It's a very cherished myth 
that goes all the way back to Plato, but it has nothing to do with brain anatomy or brain function. That's just not how your brain is structured and it's not how your brain works. So, can you, can you say that one more time? On sure. So, um, there's a very strong belief that goes all the way back to Plato that the human psyche or the human, now more mo in modern terms, the human brain has parts for rationality, parts for emotion, and they struggle with each other to get control of your behavior. This is the foundation of the legal, of the, of criminal law in the United States, this, this idea that you, of your brain having a, a basically a war in it between emotion and cognition or thinking and feeling. It's the basis of um, economic theory. It's uh, the basis of many, many, many kind of um, social and political um, uh, domains uh, in modern, in Western civilization. But it's a, it's a story. It's a story that doesn't match the anatomy of your brain. It's a story that doesn't match the functioning of your brain. Who here has ever heard the term lizard brain, that you have a lizard brain lurking inside your, yeah, like you have an animalistic brain and then wrapped on top of that is a neocortex, which is the home of cognition, which controls your very animalistic urges. Completely a myth, completely a myth. All of us in this room have a set of neurons that we share with every jawed vertebrate on this planet which is the topic of my next book. <laughs> but for today, the point is that um, there's nothing about your brain that uh, either in its function or in its structure uh, that is consistent with the idea that some parts are for feeling, some parts are for thinking, and the two of them are battling for control over your behavior. It's a good story, but it's actually just not true.